we have another son, Caleb, who's a second-year student at Word of Life, and you can pray for him. He's looking at where maybe the Lord might want him to go next, so he's not sure what college he'll be, he'll be going to. And uh, our three daughters are up in Willingboro at this time. Allison's a senior at Baptist Regional, and she's helping my uh, mother-in-law uh, with a kids club. And our youngest, Julianne, has the flu, so she's at home protecting all of you guys from uh, picking up whatever it is she has. She got the flu shot, but it didn't seem to help her too much. And our second daughter, Susanna, is uh, sort of watching over her. And I must say, maybe you have this in your family, she was delighted not to come to church. <laughs> but uh, I think she loves God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it brings back so many memories for me to be here. It's kind of like I'm going back to when I was in my college days and high school days where I attended here. And uh, it's just so exciting for me to to see so many people that I don't know and so many people that I do know. The church is, is growing, and there's uh, some churches we come back, we visit, and there's just all older folks there. And there's just such a great variety of folks here. It's just neat to see. Your worship's wonderful. Uh, we pray for you guys like you pray for us. We really appreciate your support, and it's just nice to see that the Lord's answering our prayers on your behalf as well as uh, your prayers on our behalf. Some of you may remember my sister, Cheryl, who also attended here. I'll just fill you in a little bit with her. She's married. Uh, she's teaching in Indiana now. Her husband's a nurse, and she's teaching elementary school. They have two children, uh, Joey and uh, Katie, and they're doing well. And my folks have had some, uh, some difficult times. When they left here, uh, the New Jersey area, they went up to uh, the Scranton area. Uh, so physically, my dad's just had problems. He's gone into kidney failure. He's on dialysis, but generally doing generally doing okay, but those are difficult times because those of you that remember my dad, who's a very independent spirit, doesn't like to be tied down, and having to go to the hospital three days a week has not been easy for him. Uh, so, uh, but in general, they're, they're doing well. I want to mention just a couple things. We have a display table in the back. There's a couple books back there. Some people asked about them. You're free to take the books. There's a little piece of paper there that has suggested donations. If you want to take a book and you don't have money with you, go ahead and take the book. Uh, but if you can help us out with a donation, it'll just cover expenses for us to purchase new books for the next church that we go to. Books have really been helpful for me just to learn about other people, to see what God is doing in other parts of the world. So I'd really enjoy for you to have those books. Uh, this one here called The Port of Two Brothers is a history of the area uh, where we work. There's one called In the Air for Him that uh, some of you know the Yoders, right? Alan Kim Yoder. So that's uh, Al's father-in-law was the pioneer missionary in our area. Uh, and that recounts his early stories uh, in the uh, Amazon jungle. And then there's also some just all other general books there about missions that, that would possibly be interesting for you. Uh, let's see. You know, I don't know if you've ever really thought about why people become friends. But it just seems like sometimes you meet somebody and it just seems you, you click with that person. That person's just a special or kindred spirit, bosom buddy, my mom likes to call him. I've had that happen maybe two or three times in my life. And it really is a, a, a neat thing where it just seems like your heart just kind of touches that other person's heart. Uh, and then sometimes it doesn't seem like that. It seems like there's, there's some couples that you see and they're like been married for 50, 60, 70 years and they're just still just like each other. They just like being around each other. Uh, and that's really a, a really neat thing. There's a story in the Bible that tells us about a really close heart relationship that was unexpected to some extent, and it really changed so much of the history that we have in the Bible and so much of perhaps even the history that we have in our country, which was founded on, on Bible and biblical principles, that I thought it might be interesting for us to look at that today and see uh, how the heart really affects the other aspects of our life, how we look at things. And then from this story to draw a few thoughts about how our heart for God can affect our vision for the world. But before we do that, let's take a moment and ask the Lord to guide us. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to look at your word, to uh, see some principles here. I'd ask that you would just help us to be able to take these principles and put them into practice in our life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story that we're going to talk about, you can find it in uh, 1 Samuel chapters 14 through 23. Uh, it's the story of David and Jonathan. So many of you are well acquainted with the story of David, but as I've looked at their relationship, uh, I find it really interesting from Jonathan's perspective. We always look at David as that person after God's own heart, 
But I think Jonathan is someone that really shows me, man, how does that happen when my heart links with somebody? How does that change my life? And Jonathan's a great example of that. The first time that we hear about Jonathan is shortly after Saul becomes king. Remember, Saul was the first king uh, in the nation of Israel. And whenever they uh, called him to be king, they didn't have an organized nation. They didn't have an army. They were under the oppression of the Philistines. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 13, 22, that there were only two swords in all of Israel. There were only two swords, one for Jonathan and one for King Saul. So, I mean, they didn't have a lot of organization. They were really building things from the ground up. And, but despite that, the first story we hear about Jonathan is kind of an amazing story of his reliance and his trust on God. The Bible tells us that, uh, and this is in, uh, oh, let me see, where is that, that the... Uh, I think it's in 1 Samuel, it's right after 13 in that section, that the Bible says that uh, the Philistines had garrisons, had these little outposts throughout Israel, and one of them happened to be up on a hill. And the one day Jonathan went out with uh, his helper, his sword bearer, the guy that carried around his sword or carried the shield, and as he said, hey, let's just go out and see what God does for us. We're going to go out and show ourselves at this uh, garrison. I guess it would be like on the hill there. And he got out there and he said, we're going to show ourselves, and if they say, hey, come up here, we want to talk to you, then we'll go up there and see what God does. And if they say, hey, come down here, we're going to come down and talk to you. He said, we'll wait here and see what God does. So they got there, and uh, they showed themselves, and I guess they had their swords, so they realized that it wasn't just a friendly encounter. And the guy said, hey, come up here, we're going to sport with you. We're going to have some fun with you, play with these guys. So he goes, okay, guy, let's go up there. They had to climb up a hill. It says they went up a precipice. So they're up there like mountain climbing, get up to the top. And in an area that probably was about the size, maybe of this sanctuary here, not a really big area, it says that Jonathan started fighting with these guys. He would knock them down, and his sword bearer would knock them off. I guess he had the sword. So I don't know exactly how it went, but they, they killed about 20 people that day. And you know, the Bible's kind of gruesome sometimes. You know, the, the Bible tells us all the, the, the details about what happens in stories like this. And that started a whole battle between the Philistines and the, uh, and the Israelites that became a great day of victory for the Israelites. What I find interesting about Jonathan is his reliance for God is that, first of all, he went out there and he sort of said, let's go see what God does, but he just didn't stand there and say, God, do it for me. He said, let's show ourselves, and if God shows that we're supposed to stay here and fight, we'll stay here and fight. If God says, go up there and fight, we'll go up there and fight, but one way or the other, we're going to be involved. I was reading the other day in Exodus. Remember when Moses went uh, and took the people out of the land of Israel and they got up to the Red Sea? Uh, there's an interesting phrase, phraseology there, and it's in, we won't really look at it too much, but it's in Exodus chapter 14. And it says that Moses got there and he had the Pharaoh's army back there. They had the sea in front of them here and the people are all yelling and screaming, what are you going to do? And he says, wait and see what God does for you. It sounds pretty great, doesn't it? And then God turns to Moses and says, what are you doing? Get off your butt, <laughs> get off your bun, and go do something. Hold out your staff and part the waters. So it's kind of a, a different idea. Both of them were looking for God, to God, but Jonathan was a man of action. He got out there and he said, God, I'm going to go and work for you, and let's see what you do. He wasn't just going to sit back and let God. It's kind of like they used to tell me when I was looking for God's will in my life that God can't steer a parking car. I don't know if you ever tried. I was teaching my sons how to, how to drive a stick recently. And, uh, you know, you try to, before they had power steering, you try to pull that wheel over to one side or the other. It's tough. As soon as the car starts to move, it's easy. So God expects us to be moving along. And Jonathan was that man of action. He was probably someone that people looked at and said, wow, when Saul is ready to retire, Jonathan's going to make a great king for us. The second part that we, second time we see Jonathan in the scripture is right after David kills Goliath. And that's in uh, 1 Samuel 18. And after he kills Goliath, it says he came back and it says that Jonathan's heart was knit, was linked to David's heart. So they must have had some time where they were uh, talking. Jonathan was already someone in his own right that was respected, that was a warrior, that was accomplished, let's say. But then he sees David, and it's more than I think than, than just the fact that he says, wow, here's another ball player. Let me bring him, bring him on my team so that we can have a great team. He just really liked Jonathan. Something was special, and it says their hearts bonded, and they made a covenant between themselves. 
So it was almost like they became blood brothers. I don't know what their ritual was there at that time. They cut their hands, you know, we talk about doing here. But somehow these two guys said, listen, there's a special link between the two of us. And that link changed Jonathan's life. So they had this encounter. They met each other. They made a decision to sort of, okay, because my heart is linked to you, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And that changed Jonathan's life from the, for the following reason. When God began to bless David's life, and it became obvious that God was going to have David to be the next king, that was really Jonathan's spot. That was what everyone expected Jonathan to be, was the next king. But Jonathan was willing, because of his love for David and his love for God, because his heart was in the right place, he was one of the few people in the administration, let's say, of the nation of Israel, that was willing to let God direct things the way he wanted. We know that Saul, he was not at all happy with that. He tried to kill David on multiple occasions. And the other story, a third story we have about Jonathan and David is when uh, David is so sure that King Saul wants to kill him. He says, no, your dad is just going to kill me. I know he's going to kill me. He's tried a couple of times. He is dead set on killing me. And Jonathan says, no, he's just scared, but he really doesn't want to kill you. And there's been a couple of times that Jonathan talked to his dad. And finally, they have this showdown between Jonathan and his dad. And David and Jonathan set up that time where he says, listen, you go hide out for a couple of days. And we're going to, I'll meet with my dad. And if he is really set on, dead set on killing you, we're going to have this little thing between us that I'm going to come out and shoot three arrows and I'll shoot them near where you are. And this little kid that goes fetches the arrows for me, if it's safe for you to come back, I'm going to tell the kid, no, the arrows are on this side. Come back here. And that's your sign that you can come back. But if I shoot the arrows out there and when the kid's out there, I yell, hey, no, they're further away. That's your sign that you've got to get lost. You've got to get further away. And what happened? Saul was dead set on killing David. Jonathan kept his word. Uh, the kid gets the arrows, he sends the kid back to town, and then uh, the two of them have a meeting. And Jonathan tells him, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. And you would think it might work, it might just end there, that they had their friendship, kind of like I had a lot of friends when I was here, and then I go to college, they go to college, I go to Brazil, and you kind of separate. You don't really see each other that much. You kind of lose contact. It was in the days before Facebook, between LinkedIn and all these things where it was easy to keep tabs of people, even before the times that you really had, you know, the post office and things like that. But the Bible recounts one other story to me that's fascinating. And when David's hiding out in the woods, it says that Jonathan went, sought him out, and wanted to encourage him. And in uh, 1 Samuel 23, verses 17 through 18, we have this following conversation between Jonathan and between David. Jonathan says to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. All right, he knows his dad's not accepting it, his dad's fighting it, but even his dad knew that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his house. I think I skipped the... Uh, oh, it says, Even my father knows that. Uh, oh, I guess it was it. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. I don't know if I skipped that thing. But Jonathan sort of totally changed his idea in his mind. And he said, okay, I'm okay with what God wants. If God's going to put you as the pastor of the church, I'll be your assistant pastor. I realized I was supposed to be in that setting, but that's okay. If you're going to be the new king, let me be your administrative aide. Let me be the chief of your army. I'm willing for God to put you in front of me. It's kind of a great example of Jonathan having his heart in the right place, changing his total vision of what was expected for him, uh, of what maybe his ambitions were when he was younger, because of his love for David. Well, as we think about this story, just giving you that background, I want to think a little bit and reflect a little bit about how that same idea is important for us in our everyday lives. The first thing that I find in my Christian life is that when I want to know about my relationship with God, I look about my relationship with Lori, right? The Bible makes that parallel that our relationship with God is like a marriage relationship. It's a covenant relationship. It's a relationship based upon love, and it's a relationship based upon commitments. It's a relationship based upon putting the other person first. And uh, 
So when I think about my relationship with Lori, when I think about how I met Lori, you know, you have that first encounter where she's on one side of the room and you're on the other side of the room and you're kind of looking at each other and you're wondering what she thinks. And, uh, you know, we met at a college and career group and uh, I sort of knew of her family. I didn't really know her. I was in medicine. I was thinking about what type of physician I might want to be. Uh, and I wanted to be able to contact with her, but I was kind of shy and I, I realized her dad was a pediatrician. So I said, ah, this is my in. I'm going to ask her what type of doctor I should be for the mission field and to ask her dad. And then she'll have to write back in touch with me, and then I'll write back to her. And you know, <laughs> Little did I know, she was praying to marry a missionary surgeon. So she said, oh, you're in medical school and you want to be a missionary? I'm sure God wants you to be a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it turns out, that's the way the Lord, the Lord led me and led us to get, to get married. But uh, that first encounter, you know, there came a point in our lives where we said, you're the person for me, and you make that, you make that commitment. You know, you get, you get married. Lori and I, uh, just about two weeks ago on January 1st, we had our 25th wedding anniversary. Uh, and I remember we were thinking back about that, and Pastor Vince sang at our wedding. You know, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be at Pastor Vince's church, but fortunately he's not here. Maybe he'll be here tonight. He's going to be here tonight, you know? We're not sure what time he gets back, right? All right, well... If not, you can tell them that we still remembered him finally from our, from our wedding there. Um, that idea of, of meeting somebody and your heart kind of links to them and passion uh, is so clear from us when we're dating. It's clear to us in a lot of things. Uh, passion is just part of what makes life fun, what makes life interesting. Passion, you have it here in your worship service. It's just, there's, a, there's a vibrancy there. You can just sort of feel it. You like being here. Uh, when I was... Uh, watching, you know, Pastor Vinch coach the girls' soccer team. Uh, my one daughter was the team, and not so much on her team, but when I watched the junior high girls' team, uh, it was easy to tell which girls were passionate about it and which girls weren't. I don't know if you've ever watched the girls. There are some girls that are out there, and the ball comes, and they're, they're looking at the ball, and it runs by them. And they, hey, go get the ball. Oh, yeah, and they run over to the ball, and they kick to somebody. And <laughs> there are other girls in that team. Man, that ball comes over there, and they see some other player there, and they give an elbow, and then they take the ball. And, you know, they're just totally passionate about just really getting into that game. The thing that strikes me the most as I think about passion, I had, a, I had a case, maybe it was probably about two months ago now, about a shih tzu dog. Uh, I'm a trauma surgeon. I'm working on furlough. I, I work part-time to keep my surgical skills up, and I'm working over at Reading Hospital. And we had a patient come in that was attacked by a shih tzu dog. <laughs> Sounds funny, you know, a shih tzu dog's about this big. But <laughs> why it reminded me of passion is that uh, this poor, poor boy... Um, he's, he's paralyzed. He was, he's uh, had some sort of neurologic problem, and so he was at home, and I guess he plays tug-of-war with, with the dog sometimes. You know how you do, you give him a bone or something like that, or a rag, and he's pulling, and he's done that. Well, anyway, the dog must have thought he wanted to play because he grabbed his sock, all right? So this dog literally pulled the toe off of this boy. <laughs> Not just one foot, but he started playing with the other foot, and the boy is paralyzed, and he has no feeling. So he didn't realize it, all right? But I can just imagine this dog there going, just having fun and passionately whining, boom. So anyway, fortunately, it was only the tips of his toes, and he didn't walk anyway, so it wasn't a, a major problem for this boy. But I just thought, man, that is a dog with passion. <laughs> can you imagine what a, what a passionate dog that would be? Um, when we think about our relationship with God, isn't that really what... What Jesus said when someone came to him one day and said, what's the most important thing about life? What's the biggest commandment, the most important commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the other is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's all heart. You know, God's not into rules. Rules are something that, that we set up to try to help guide us uh, through life. But God's really interested in where our heart is. When our heart's in the right place, we make the right decisions. I don't know if anyone ever read the book, Good to Great. It's a business book that talks about uh, comparing different companies uh, that were equal at one point in time, and then they followed them for 20 years. It was a retrospective study, and they saw one company just took off and one didn't. And then they went back and they looked and saw what was the difference between these different companies. And one of the things that they found that was different was when you hire good people, people that had a heart to work, that were really interested in work, you didn't have to have rules in your company. You could focus on your job. 
But when you have a company that's filled with people that are just sort of punching the clock, they don't really want to be there, then you spend all your time trying to manage your employees and little time actually working on what you want to work on. So heart, even in the business world, is so important. Well, in my relationship with Lori after 25 years, you can imagine that we've had some very passionate times and some not so passionate times. Times where you kind of drift away from one another. And a couple years ago, when we were in Brazil, I was kind of uh, struggling with this a little bit because you know, I was just thinking, you know, sometimes I don't, I'm not all that excited about going home. You know, it's just kind of easier at work, and you know, uh, you're just not that passionate about that person anymore. I mean, I've, I've always liked Lori, but it just seems that sometimes she can get under my skin. You know, and I don't know if that happens if that happens with you sometimes. But I started thinking about that and thinking about, you know, how can I improve that relationship? I mean, I go through, I take other people through counseling that hate each other. They're fighting and stuff, and, and you get them back to biblical principles, and their relationship can go back to being a really passionate, loving relationship that glorifies God. And I said, man, if I can't make this work in my own life, you know, how can I help someone else? And if I can help someone else do it, how can I do it in my, my, my own life before I start crashing and burning? You know, you don't want to get to the point where, where things are horrible. So I started asking myself a couple questions. And I'd like to pass four questions out to you today that I have found helpful in my life. And then we're going to think about that from, from the scriptural standpoint and, and our relationship with God. Uh, I started thinking to myself, when do I think about Laurie? When do I think about Laurie? Uh, and I realized I could go through the whole day without even thinking about her. Other than when I got up in the morning, we said hello, pecked each other in the cheek, and then I would go to work. Uh, good missionary that I am at the Baptist hospital, right? But I wasn't thinking about my wife. I wasn't treating my wife, as the scripture says, as that precious piece of porcelain that I really treasure, right? Um, when I was dating her, was it like that? No, I thought about my wife, well, my uh, girlfriend at that time, all the time. You know, even if I saw a car that was remotely like hers, I'd start following it, thinking maybe that's my wife's car, my future wife's car, whatever, you know? Because you were just interested. You're wondering what she's doing. No matter what you're doing, you sit there thinking, oh, I wonder what Lori's doing now. Should I call Lori? Well, at that time, we didn't have cell phones, so it wasn't so easy. But uh, I found out that, you know, I wasn't really even thinking about my wife. Worse yet, I asked myself, what do I think about my wife when I think about her? And I found that a lot of times I was focusing on all those little negative things. You know, so often we talk about love being blind. You know, someone starts dating somebody and all they ever see are the good things about that person, right? And, and the parents are there sometimes saying, wait, 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 you don't see something. There's something you don't see and you just don't want to hear it, you know, because you're only focusing on the good parts of the other person. That's one of the wonderful things about love, right? The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. It, it helps us just, I don't want to say necessarily overlook, but we don't emphasize them when we're really in love with that person. Uh, but I found out that I was thinking a lot of things. If something didn't go right at home, when I thought about Lori, that's what I was thinking about. Ah, oh, you remember that? So then I came home, and what was the first thing that was thinking on my mind? You know, that last bad interaction that we had. And unfortunately, I'm one of those guys that can stew. Lori's got a wonderful temperament that if she gets uh, perturbed about something, you know, 10 minutes later, she seems to have forgotten it. She just has that way to, to turn her, maybe she has forgotten, I don't know, but she seems to be able to, to just, you know, put it aside and go on to the next thing and treat me normally. Man, it takes me about three weeks, it seems, sometimes to, to get my life back uh, to where I feel. If I wait till I feel right, man, it'll never happen. Uh, Another thing that, uh, that someone mentioned to me, he said, if you want to change your relationship with your wife, he said, compliment her three times a day. You know, just look for things that are, that are important. Uh, and it was interesting, I got in the car today, and uh, uh, Reed was driving, so I was being chauffeured down here to, from Willingboro, and they had a healthy living from Sam's Club, and it had Oprah and, uh, what is this, Carpa, Chopra, I guess, Deepak Chopra. Uh, lessons in gratitude. And I was flipping through there and I said, wow, this is exactly what I was trying to do with Lori. Uh, so I'm just going to read a couple things here to say that even the world sees how important it is to look at uh, complimenting people, being gracious, looking for the, 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 the pleasant things in life. Uh, so uh, there's three things that Oprah says here that kind of changed her life. One is she says, 16 years ago, 
uh, I started a gratitude journal. We talk about prayer journals, God answering prayers, things like that. She started a gratitude journal. Oprah says, I have to say, it's the single most important thing I've ever done. So every day for, a year, for years now, I've written down the things that I'm grateful for because there's power in words, even simple things uh, like fresh flowers or someone's holding the door open for me. Writing these moments of gratitude down helps me focus on the good in my life. That's just kind of a practical suggestion, but doesn't the scripture say, you know, be gracious, give thanks in all things, it says in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, they talk about taking a gratitude walk. So many times I've, talk, I've heard and people talk about taking a prayer walk, go around in, in prayer, but they talk about taking a gratitude walk. Set aside 20 minutes or longer if you can and walk around your neighborhood, through a park, around your office, somewhere in nature, advises uh, shop, the Shopper Center, uh, which is the, the center that this uh, one gentleman uh, founded. Pay attention to your senses, everything you're seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, and maybe even tasting, and see how many things you can find to feel grateful for. But when I was thinking about Lori, I wasn't thinking about all the wonderful things that she did. Lori's a wonderful cook. Unfortunately, she married somebody that, I mean, I can just eat anything. And so because of that, uh, if it's good food, that's fine. If it's horrible food, that's fine. <laughs> you know, If the house is clean, that's fine. If the house is dirty, that's fine. But I can be very ungrateful because I can come, I just don't, doesn't matter to me. So if I come home and the house is spotless, all right. But if she worked all day, you think she might want to hear, wow, the house looks wonderful? Yeah, it would be very encouraging for her to hear that. And the other thing they said, be intentional. If you wake up in the morning and consciously look for things to be thankful for, you're more alive and receptive to the goodness that comes into your life. And so often, a number of years ago, I started getting into practice of praying before I got out of bed. So I wake up, and I just start off the day, God, just thanks for being here. I'm just thankful that I'm here for the many blessings that you've given me, for my wife, for my, for my kids, for a house, for, you know, whatever it is that comes to my mind. I just say thank you and, and bless this day. And I've really found that that helps me sort of set the tone. So that idea of gratitude, uh, it's a biblical idea, and it's something that even folks like Oprah, anyone else, understands and sees. The fourth question I started asking myself was that, what do, was, what do I do to try to please my wife? Uh, and that was probably the worst because I wasn't doing much of anything. So I had to start thinking, what can I do just to make Lori smile, to make Lori happy, to be nice for her, and to be nice to her? And a lot of times, things like that can be just simple things. Uh, this past week, uh, when I go to Reading Hospital, I usually go for two or three days at a time. Uh, so I do my time over there in blocks. It just makes it easier because I'm commuting over to there. And so I spend a, a night or two in the hotel, and they always put a little candy or, you know, a mint or a chocolate or something like that on your bed. So I have a choice. I'm allergic to chocolate, so it was an easy choice last time when they had chocolate there. <laughs> I'm going to save this for Lori because Lori loves chocolate. Um, but, I mean, when they had little mints and stuff like that, I take the mints home for her. Now, is that a big thing? No, but what does it say? Hey, I was thinking about you. You're important to me. I care about you. There are so many things you can do. Uh, I, one of the things I was never uh, one to be touchy and stuff like that, but Lori likes for, to play with her hair. So if you're sitting in a, in a church or a meeting like that, you know, just play with her hair, rub her neck, something like that. You know, just little things that as you get to know somebody, you get to know what they like. You know, what makes them feel special? And if you focus on those things, <laughs> if you have hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> I saw wherever they're trying to find some. It just <laughs> well, you know, in our relationship with God, I started asking myself those same four questions. And those are the questions I'd like to, to leave with you today as you think about where is my heart with God? Uh, those same types of questions. Uh, and but before you get there, you gotta think, do I know God? You know, so when I started asking myself, what do I do for my wife? The first question you need to ask, are you married? So the scripture tells us that all of us have encounters with God. You may not think of that, but everybody has encounters with God. We can just look outside. We see the stars. We see his handiwork. Uh, we look at me as a physician at the human body. You see these intricacies. And, and I'm still, as much as so many of my friends uh, at work will look and think that evolution is is the way that things happen, that they'll think that somehow this all came to be without some sort of input from outside. 
I think more and more even science is coming to understand that there was some sort of intelligence, there was some sort of master designer, this intelligent design idea that uh, things just don't get more and more complicated, you know, just on their own. Nothing that we know of does that other than really the theory of evolution. Uh, but people are just so blind to that because they've made a decision in their hearts to sort of close off their things. I read a fascinating book uh, called Leadership and Self-Deception. If any of you would like to read about what makes you tick on the inside, uh, it's a book that, that takes this idea, and I won't develop the whole idea because it'll take a long time, but basically what they say is that when you have a choice to do something or believe something or not, and you go against it, you set up a whole series of consequences in your life. Um, and the simple thing he starts out with, let's say your, your wife and you are in bed, you have a new child and the baby's crying, and you're both sitting there saying, who's going to get out of bed? You know, type of thing. But you don't know if your wife's awake or not. And you have this idea, you know, it would be good for me to help my wife. As soon as I say, no, I'm not going to do that. As soon as I turn down that thing that, that I know is true that I should do, then all of a sudden my mind starts doing a whole bunch of things, behaviors, to justify why I made that decision. Oh, I've got to work, I've got this, I've got that. She really has a less uh, easier life than I have. And you know what, she's kind of lazy anyway, so she should get up. And you start vilifying the other person and justifying yourself. It's, it's fascinating if you ever want to get that book and, and look at it. But I, I was thinking the same thing happens with people. They look out and they sort of see, man, this had to be made by somebody, and they turn off that thought. And then all of a sudden, they have to rationalize that. They have to justify that. And the only way you can end up justifying that is to make God not exist. And that's basically what happens with evolution. People start doing that. They end up with God can't exist because I don't want to accept that idea that there's a master designer, creator, that I might be responsible for. Today, you're here, and we have the scripture, right? You're here in church. You have an opportunity. Maybe you, you believe in God. Maybe you've never really thought a whole lot about about your relationship with God, but God wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with each one of us. So that's really the first step that we have to take as we think about what's our relationship with God. Do you really know him? And when the Bible says that we have to make that decision, like Jonathan and David came and said, okay, you're a special person. I want to make a commitment to you. God requires each of us to make a commitment to him. Admit that we're a sinner. Admit that we're not going to uh, fix everything in our life on our own. And he wants us just to basically put our trust and say, God, I'm willing to let you be the boss. God says if we don't do that, we're rebelling against him. And one day when we stand before him and give him an account for that, there's only one punishment for rebellion against God, and that's death, eternal death. But that's why Christ came. He died for us. He paid that death for us. So we're not going to go a whole lot into that. But if you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that's really where it starts. It starts by making that commitment there. And then... It says we become one of his children. Well, I suspect the majority of you here probably have, have heard that. Uh, you've probably made a commitment or walking with God. And if you're walking with God wholeheartedly or if you're married and you're passionately in love with your spouse, I would just say keep doing what you're doing. That's wonderful. But I'm sure there are many people here that would say, you know, my relationship with my spouse is kind of a little, my relationship with God kind of goes up, kind of goes down. I'm not really on a real great spot right now. If you want to improve your relationship with God, those four questions, these four questions can help you. And I would, I would phrase them this way. One, when you think about God, when do you think about God? Is it only when you're going to pray for a meal and stuff like that? Or do you think about God throughout the day? It helps just to remind yourself that, that God is there. Uh, I heard one guy used to set his watch, the watches with the beepers on them, so it would beep every hour, and then he would just say, oh, God's with me. Just that little reminder that God is with you is helpful. The second would be sort of akin to what do you think about when you think about God? Some people will be thinking, God, why didn't I get that job? God, why does this happen to me? Why is that? Just like I could be thinking about all those negative things about my wife. Or you could be thinking about, wow, God, um, you created the world and you love me. You could be thinking about all the positive things. Uh, and right alongside of that goes with gratitude. As I think about the positive things about my wife, I can be gra gracious, or not gracious, I can be grateful for all those things that she's done. I can express that gratitude. Uh, my heart with God should be the same. I should be looking around, and there are so many things that, that happen that we just take for granted. You know, whether you get to work on time, whether you don't run into a traffic jam on 295, 
uh, whether you're able to get a project done on time, uh, whether the internet's working, you know, whatever it might be. There are just so many things that just happen that we just say, oh, that's normal. You know, that's God really being gracious. There's not one thing that happens to us that doesn't come from God, right? James tells us he's the, the father of lights. All these blessings, all these good things come down, and we like to just sort of say, well, that's just normal life. It's the really special things is when God is working for me. But really, all the good things that happen. And for us to be voicing that and praying and just saying, God, thank you during the day for when those things happen, sort of changes our whole perspective and our heart attitude towards God. And uh, the last one would be just thinking about what special things can I do to please God? And I would suggest to you that the most important thing to God is people. And when we do things for other people, that really pleases God. So as you think about what can I do to please God, to make God smile uh, in Sunday school, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting our brother's name over there, but he was sharing about, uh, I think, one of his children that uh, was sharing his faith, right? And that just made his heart wonderful. You know, just to see my son or my daughter share their faith just makes me happy. When I see my daughter make a goal or something on the basketball court or on the soccer field, wow, you just get, just, just, you know, it's just wonderful. Uh, when God sees us do these things, I think he just bubbles over with joy. The angels sing when one person repents, and I think every time we do something that's helpful to other people, God as well just puts a big smile on his face. So as we do those things, and as we really start to look at where our heart is and trying to please God with our heart, you know what we're going to find? Our vision changes. Our perspective of things changes. Our outlook for other people in our neighborhood, what we're going to do at church changes. And that's the thought that I would like to, to leave with you. Just work on your heart. And you'll find out that your vision for God becomes so much clearer. Uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this time just to think about your word and uh, some of these principles. I'd ask you would help us to uh, put these things in practice in our lives. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.